it's okay to pray with some passion. It's okay to pray with some pleading, some energy, some tears, some emotion. It's, it's okay to worship that way too. Well, what we're doing is we're kind of walking through some of the Psalms, and we started this uh, th- uh, four weeks ago where we just are picking a Psalm and walking through it, and we jumped four and we came to Psalm chapter five. Um, I don't know about you personally, and maybe I shouldn't ever acknowledge this as a pastor, but one of the, one of the most difficult spiritual disciplines for me in my walk has always been my prayer time, in a sense, um, You know, not necessarily doing it, but finding a rhythm to it, uh, finding a pattern to it. Um, And and one of the things that's really helped me is I read a book here several years ago, and it said one of the greatest things you can do for your prayer life is to pray the Psalms. Take the Psalms and pray them. And Psalms 5 is uh, one of those great Psalms that you can pray. It teaches us a lot about approaching God Really, I believe one of the purposes why God gave us the book of Psalms in the Bible is it is to teach us how to pray. Because the psalmist here is is approaching God in a way that teaches us how, that's very powerful for us as far as approaching God is concerned. So in this passage, I thought I would read through it and then we would come back and talk about it. But in this passage, it really teaches us how to approach God. Approaching God can be a very, very intimidating thing. But yet, as his children, uh, there is, I think there is a right and a wrong way to approach him. And I think that this passage tonight teaches us how. So let's read it, and then let's come back and talk about it, and give you some things that the psalmist teaches us in regard to how to pray. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for to you I will pray. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. You shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. In fear of you, I will worship towards your holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongues. Pronounce them guilty, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against you. But let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor, you will surround them as with a shield. Father, I thank you tonight for the chance that we have to look at your word. I thank you for all of those that are here this evening. Lord, we all desire to communicate with you in a more efficient way. Um, in, in, a, in a way where we really feel this connection with you. And Lord, we are grateful for this, this psalm who teaches us a lot about how David approached you, and there's a lot that we can learn from it. So Lord, may this help our prayer lives as we examine exactly what David says in the fifth psalm. We pray that we would all be challenged, encouraged, and blessed by what we hear tonight. In Christ's name we pray, amen. One, the first thing that I want you to notice that he does here and that we should do in, in approaching God is, one, come to God continually. Notice what he says. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. When I communicate with you, uh, I, there, I am limited in the amount that I can communicate with you, meaning that um, I can communicate with you verbally, face-to-face, and so we can, we can talk that way, so I can walk up to you and approach you. I'm limited by the amount of people that I can talk to at once. I don't know about you, but I have a little ADD, and so I can't talk to multiple people. I kind of have to be locked in on one. And so, so I can talk to you that way. I can uh, communicate with you through a, a cell phone. I can pick up a phone and call you and talk to you that way. I can maybe text is another way of communication. 
But I am, to a certain degree, limited in the amount of communication I can do with you um, just because of my physical body. We pray to a God who is everywhere all the time. Okay? So there is no limitation to how much you can communicate with him. So he doesn't say, you know, there, I, know I know there's some things out now that you can put apps and different things on your phone where you can limit the amount of uh, usage that you do on the phone for your children, for example, or maybe you need to do it for your husband. I'm not sure. But um, you can limit the amount of usage. God, there's no limit. So what he says here is he says, give ear to my words, O Lord, and consider my meditation. One of the things that it says, it talks about in the New Testament is it says that we are to pray without ceasing. So I should not only verbally communicate to God my concerns, my praise, uh, my needs, but I should also constantly be in this, in this spirit of prayer. I should not only practice the habit of prayer, but I should also be constantly practicing the spirit of prayer. And what that means is, is that God is always on my thinking. He's always on my mind. That I'm always directing my thought process and my kind of questions to him above all others. This is what the psalmist is doing. He's saying, give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. He's always constantly thinking about this in terms of God and thinking about, okay, I have this situation that's in front of me. And he may not be out loud saying it, but he is meditating on it and thinking about, God, what would you have me to do? What do I need to do here? I need your help. He's asking for his assistance. He's meditating on the fact that God is ever present with him and he is continually asking for his help. Um, God should not be this thing that we just do for, this prayer should not be this thing that we just do for a limited amount of time, but it should be something that we're constantly doing. We're consistently doing. We're always in the spirit of prayer, even if we're not in the actual habit of prayer, but we should always be in the spirit of prayer. And one of the things that it's great to know about God is he does not sleep. He never gets tired. He's not absent. We can communicate with him at any time and any day. And so we should be coming to God continually. The second thing I want you to notice is in verse number uh, two, when he says, give heed to the voice of my cry. So the second thing that the psalmist is teaching us about prayer is not only should we come to God continually, but we should also come to God passionately. We should also come to God passionately. Hearken unto the voice of my cry. I, I love to hear people kind of make excuses about why they don't get passionate with God. Uh, and, and they say, well, I'm just not a very uh, passionate individual. And then I go to ball games with them. Right? I mean, look, the, the reason why that we get so passionate at games is because we have a lot invested in that team that's out there. You know, we've listened to sports talk radio. We've read stuff on the radio. I mean, read, if you've read stuff on the radio, that would be an interesting concept. But we've read stuff in the paper. We've, we've analyzed the team. We have a lot of kind of mental thought process engaged in that particular team so we go to the game and somebody gets a hit or somebody makes a basket or somebody scores a touchdown and produces this reaction in us because we've invested so much in it that the passion comes out see I think everybody's passionate about something and so what do we do they hit the they hit the uh, bucket and we start to clap I just, I love to watch people um, cheer on their teams. You know, especially, it's one thing to be in the arena, but have you ever gone to somebody's house and watched them, and they're like screaming at the television? It's like, you understand that this, this synergy that you're sitting, it doesn't help them. It's doing nothing but upsetting you. You know what I'm saying? They're yelling at the TV, they're screaming at the TV. It's like, come on, make a basket. And it's like, th this doesn't contribute to the people that are on the floor because they're not, they can't hear you. And yet we look at that and we're totally cool with it. It's like this is normal. But we watch somebody passionately try to get God's attention in a sense. 
And we think that's really weird. You got to be careful about that. The psalmist, I believe, prayed passionately. I mean, he prayed with passion. He, he, he cried when he prayed. It, it was, he wanted God to work in this particular situation or in this instance more than he wanted anything else. And I think that the, the extent that we pray and how we pray reveals the passion of our heart. It reveals how much we have invested in this relationship. So when you come to God and you pray, it's okay to pray with some passion. It's okay to pray with some pleading, some energy, some tears, some emotion. It's, it's okay to worship that way too. Now, should all things be done decently and in order, in particular in a public setting type form? Absolutely. But boy, we don't want to discourage passionate participation in something that God has called us to do. And this is the psalmist. He says, give, hear, give heed to the voice of of my cry. He is, he is pleading with God. He is passionate about his God. He is passionate about God working. What is the last thing that you prayed passionately about? What is the last thing that you prayed passionately about? That I mean, remember how Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? He prayed so intensely that he was sweating blood. And what was he praying? Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but thine be done. Jesus knew what was coming, and he prayed with some passion. And this is how we should pray. Pray with some passion. Pray with some energy. It shows what is important to you. It shows God what is important to you. Tears reveal, emotion reveal what's on the inside. And this is how the psalmist prays. He comes to God passionately. God is moved by your tears. Thought about that? Come to him passionately. The next thing, notice what he says. Give ear to my Voice, give heed to the voice of my cry, my king and my God, for to you I will pray. Number three, come to God confidently. I love the language here. It's my king and my God. I love that. What he's implying here is we have a warm, personal, intimate relationship with God. We're family, right? We're in the family. He's our dad. So we're talking to, this is my king and my God. The deeper the relationship, the more I can kind of assert myself into a conversation. Let, let me give you an example of what I mean. I mean, my office is right here by the women's bathroom. A lot of people get that confused and think that my office is the women's bathroom. And... Uh, so it's some funny sometimes on Sunday morning that a lot of ladies walk in there and like, oh, this isn't the women's bathroom? Does it look like the women's bathroom? So anyway, so um, it would be really weird if I'm sitting in the women's bathroom. So um, anyway, <laughs> that's terrible. But, um, and if you've ever said that, I apologize. Um, but this is the deal. M most people, when they find out that's my office, this is how they approach it. They, they, and even the staff here, if the door's shut, what do they do? They come to the door and they knock on the door. I look in the window, and I give them the, the node that they are allowed to enter. You know, I don't necessarily want it that way, but, but I appreciate the respect, you know, that I could be in the middle of a conversation or something. It's just a courtesy thing, and I, that doesn't mean I want that to stop. Now, let me tell you something about Karen. Karen never has to knock. She's my wife. So Karen doesn't have to come to the door and go, can I come in? She's my wife. She, and let me tell you about something about my kids. They don't knock at all. They just walk right in. Right? Because they're my kids. 
So my kids, even when they were little, it's like you have free access to dad's office, whichever room dad's office is. You have free access to dad's office. So if, if he's in there, you can approach, you can come in confidently because who's in that room is my father. In the same way, this is how we should approach God. Not timidly coming up to the throne. This is our dad. And dads love to hear from their kids. And this is what the, how the psalmist is praying. He's saying, give heed to the voice of my cry, my king and my God. He's, he's implying personal relationship. If you uh, have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have a relationship with God. He is your father. You're his child. You're in the family. So you can approach your dad with confidence. And you can come confidently to the throne. Why? Because of what Jesus Christ has done, right? What, what does it say in Hebrews? Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? Because we're in the family. So when I pray and when I talk to God, I want to come to God confidently. Verse 3. This is a great verse for our um, early morning prayer on five thir- at, at uh, 630 on Monday mornings. Verse 3, my voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct to you, I will direct it to you, and I will look up. N- number four, the fourth thing is come to God consistently. Come to God consistently. Now, I don't want to sound legalistic here, and I'm not trying to imply that. But I, I heard a preacher say this. Uh, actually, John Corson said this. He says, I find that when I do not come to God in the morning, I usually spend my evenings mourning. Why is that? Because of the fact that if I don't make God the number one priority, then God tends to get put off. And then I get to the end of the day, and I'm like, oh, yeah, it's, now it's time to spend time with God. And mentally I'm shot, and I'm exhausted, and I kind of go through my Bible time. I think you should make it a priority in your life. First thing you do in the morning is you spend time with God on a consistent basis. And I'm a big advocate in that not only should you uh, do it in the morning, but I think you should have a place. And one of the things we started is is our prayer uh, service here on Monday mornings at 6.30. And a lot of that is just to to help you in your prayer time with God because it maybe helps start the week off right, get you into some kind of a pattern where you come in here and you spend a little time in the Word, you spend a little time in prayer, and maybe then our prayer or our hope is that you'll do that on Tuesday and that you'll do that on Wednesday and that you'll do that on Thursday and Friday. And you get in this habit of first thing in the morning you go to a particular spot. Now, maybe that's, obviously that spot is not here from Tuesday through Saturday or Tuesday through Sunday, but at least you're kind of getting in the groove of this is how I'm starting my week of putting God first and coming to God consistently on a consistent basis early in the morning. You know, for me personally, we have a love seat that we bought actually from Justin when he sold his furniture. And it's so funny because it's this, uh, we, it's, it's this love seat that has um, kind of a, a part in the middle where you can set drinks and stuff and it doesn't move. It. And then you have these buttons that you push on the side and it raises up, you know. And, and they, it screaks incredibly loud. So you push it and it's like, you know, somebody's dying out in the... Uh, that's pretty much exactly how it sounds, too. So, so you always know when everybody's sitting, when they're reclining and when they're getting up. And, uh, but my, my habit, my pattern kind of is I get up, and I walk out to the one on the right-hand side, and I turn my uh, lamp on, and I sit in that particular spot, and that's where I meet with God every morning. And so I, that, ho- that whole love seat thing has fallen apart um, because we've been so hard on it. I, I blame it on the interns who lived at our house over the summer, but um, but but um, we we're talking about getting new furniture and stuff in there. But but I want to make sure that we replace that, or because that's the spot where I meet with God. And even when we ever sell that house, uh, I'll drive by there knowing every morning that was the spot that I met with God on this consistent basis. Where we met. This is where I heard from him. This is where we talked about some really serious stuff about what God was doing in my life. And this is where he gave me peace. And this is where he scolded me a little bit. And this is where he, and this is just that, that little spot kind of 
it may be a rocking chair for you. It may be in setting in, the, in, in your car before you walk into work. It may, be, it may be, but have a spot where you meet with God early in the day on a consistent basis. And I don't want to, like I said, I don't want to sound legalistic about that, but most people who have ended up doing great things for God, they had a consistent time with God early in the morning. And this is, this is the psalmist is encouraging that here. He says, my voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you. So he starts his day with God in a particular space, in a particular spot. And in a sense, what he's saying is, God, you know you're going to hear my voice in the morning. There's consistency in his prayer life. Do you know God would like to hear from you? even when things are going well in your life? You know, we all pray when we're sick. We all pray when there's danger. Look, I've been on planes with terrible turbulence. I've heard people talk to God who was, who was cursing him two minutes before. Everybody talks to God in a crisis. Isn't it, don't you think that it would please God to hear our voice every day, even in the good days? Because God is a great God and a good God, and he deserves our praise. And, and we need to consistently lift our voice up to him and get our focus on him. Because this is what happens. When life's going well and we don't need him, we tend to then get our eyes off of the Lord and on ourselves. And we tend to think how awesome and great we are. And then, then trouble comes and we look back to God. This was the Israelites, right? They're always, things would go well, and then, and then they, would, they would kind of, get proud and, and take the credit for the success that was due to God. And so God would have to bring something in their life that get their attention. How about we just talk to God all the time? And that's what the psalmist did. Every day, good, bad, sunrise, uh, the, or, or, or the, the, it's raining or snowing, he is, he is consistently coming to God every morning and saying, God, I'm here just to spend a little time with you, just to talk to you. What else does he say? He says, my voice you shall hear in the morning. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. Number five, come to God expectantly. What's he looking up? He's looking up, waiting to see the answer. Now, I believe this about prayer. I believe that God answers every prayer that we pray. And the answer is yes or no or not yet. But I believe that when he says no, it is for his glory and our good. I believe that. So what I have to do is, is I pray and I bring my requests to God and I come expectantly that God's going to answer. And this is the thing about God answering. God's going to answer in his time. And his way, but I'm going to keep looking, and I'm going to keep praying, and I'm going to keep trusting. I'm not going to allow my head to hang because things are not turning out the way I wanted, or God's not answering the way that I wanted. I'm going to keep looking up to him and trusting in him. And this is what the psalmist is doing. He's looking up. You, you know when they say that, that um, he probably wrote this, and there's a lot of, contro not controversy, but there's a lot of speculation about when the psalmist wrote this. He probably wrote this when he's dealing with this whole situation with Absalom. Boy, it's easy. What, one of the great things that prayer does is it gets our eyes off of the situation and onto God. Because no matter what you're going through, God is greater. Prayer does that. It takes my focus off of the situation in front of me and onto the God who is greater than anything that's going on around me. So what happens is if I consistently come to God in prayer, what prayer does is it changes my focus. And so I'm having some success in my life. And so if I come to God consistently on a, day, on a daily basis and I look up, I look beyond my success and start to say, you know, boy, I tell you what, man, I'm, I'm, I'm having this success because I'm really killing it. But prayer then says, no, I ha I'm having the success because God is showing me his favor. Well, if I'm going through a rough time, 
then I come to God and I'm tempted to get my head down and, and my emotions down. And when I come to God, I look up and I, I remember that all things work together for good to those who love God. God gives me a better perspective. That's what prayer does. So if I come to him on this consistent basis, I come knowing that he hears my prayers, that he's going to answer them according to his will, and that in the end I trust him. That's the psalmist. That's what he's doing here. Next, verse 4. Now, this is, this is interesting here because listen to what he says. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. You shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. Now, when I first read this, I thought, okay, he's talking about if I'm going to come to God, I must come to God purely. But then I thought about who's the author of this? David. David has done all of this stuff. Right? I mean, he has, uh, he's been boastful. He has, he has um, done wicked things. He has, he has spoken falsehood. He, is, he has blood on his hands. Did he not kill a man? Because he had an affair and he tried to hide the affair, so then he killed uh, Bathsheba's husband. He's been bloodthirsty. He's been deceitful. He, 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 he hid it from, he, tr- he tried to cover the whole thing. So he says all of this, and all of this is true about God. Then he says, but as for me, I will come into your house. How? In the multitude of your mercy. In, the, in fear of you, I will worship towards your holy temple. How should I pray? Number six, I should come to God humbly. There's not one person in this room pure enough to walk into the Holy of Holies and pray to God. But we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, right? So I couldn't come to God without Jesus. This should humble me. So when I come to God, I'm coming with the knowledge that This is possible because Jesus paved the way for me. Never forget that every one of us in this room stand on the shoulders of somebody else. We all stand on the shoulders of somebody who paved a way for us. And all of us in this room, every single one of us in this room, stand on the shoulders of Jesus Christ to have access to God the Father. And that should never make us proud. It should always make us humble. That's why prayer, that's why we advocate prayer. You can pray anywhere. You can pray in any position. But this is why we get, we kneel a lot of times when we pray. We're getting in a position of humility. You're understanding who you are and that you have no access to the Father outside of Jesus Christ. Because Our righteousness is as filthy rags in the eyes of God. Are you with me, church? So when I come to God, I come like like David did. I come understanding that I can come to his house because of his mercy and that I have this great fear, this great reverence for God because were it not for Christ, I could not come at all. So come to God humbly. Then, number seven, the seventh thing he teaches us about approaching God in prayer is come to God specifically. Come to God specifically. There's there's three things that he asks for here in verse seven and eight. But as for me, I will come into your house and the multitude of your mercy and the fear of you, I will worship towards your holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. So the first thing he asks for is he asks for guidance. 
Lead, he's asking God to lead him. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of your enemies. Make your way straight before my face. I think it's good when you pray to ask God specifically for some things. What are you looking for? What do you, what do you need direction in? Ask him. God, lead me. I have a meeting. I'm going to leave here today, and, um, and maybe you're, you're getting up early in the morning, and you're going to, 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 uh, to work, and you know that you have a difficult meeting. You have, have to have a difficult conversation, and so you're asking for direction. God, please lead me. Lead my mouth. Lead the words that I should say. Lead me in the path that I should go. Have you ever, thought, have you ever prayed about what direction you should take to work? Just a little simple thing. If, if, if prayer is something I think about all the time, then it's, God should always be on this forefront of, God, what direction would you have me to go? What would you have me to do? You know, um, what would you have me to say? I need your guidance. I need you to lead me. So the first thing he asked for is he asked for guidance. The second thing he asked for is he asked for justice. He says, for there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their trung, tongue. Pronounce them guilty, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they rebelled against you. So he's asking for specifics here. He's asking for justice. So he's coming to God with specific requests. You know, well, God knows everything, so I don't need to really be specific. No, you do need to be specific. Specifically ask for specific things, and that way when God answers those specific requests, you can see God at work. And so he's asking for justice. And then he's, the last thing he's asking for, he's asking for blessing in verses 11 and 12. But let all those who rejoice, who, let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them either shout for joy because you defend them. Let, them also, let those also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround him as with a shield. You know, one of the things that I pray for this church the most is that would God would continue to show us his favor. If there's any pastor here who thinks that we're doing what we're doing here because of our great leadership, they, they've got a pride problem. What's happening here and what's happened in our church is because God has shown his grace and his favor on our church. And he deserves the glory, and he deserves the praise. And one of the things that should continually come out of our mouth is, God, may you continue to show your favor on our church. May you continually show your favor in my marriage. May you continually show your favor on my family. May you continually show favor in my job. He's asking for blessing. There's nothing wrong for asking for that. May God be glorified in and through what I do. So, you see why I think it's a really good idea to pray the Psalms? This is a great Psalm right here. Um, it just gives us a great way to approach God. Don't let prayer intimidate you. Bad praying is better than not praying at all. And honestly, there's no such thing as bad praying. There's a lot we can learn from the Psalms. So what does the Psalmist teach us? Come to God continually. Not only, not only say it verbally, but be constantly thinking of God and thinking and asking for his direction. Be constantly in the state of prayer. Don't just, don't say, okay, I've had my God thing and I've had my God time. No, think about God all the time. Be constantly in the state of prayer. When you're at your job, be constantly thinking and asking God for direction. God will speak to you if you if you talk to him in the sense that he'll direct you. So I'm in this conversation and God what do you want me to do? And what do you want me to say? And how should I reach out to this person and what should be what should be my tone and how should I push this be constantly in that state of prayer. So come to God const continually, come to God passionately. Come to God confidently, consistently, expectantly, humbly. And when you come to God, bring specifics so that he can answer back specifically.